Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. This morning, I'll be presenting with my colleague, Natalie. Quick intro to who we are. Uh, Natalie and I are part of uh, PVizio's HR consulting team. Each one of us contributes to helping organizations excel in their HR practices. Um, our mission is connecting with organizations, empowering them to become the best versions of themselves so that they can achieve continuous growth and success. Natalie and I share many of the same HR focus areas in the employee experience and organizational development spheres. So that's ranging from recruitment practices to employee engagement, talent management, training and coaching, up to the interpretation of labor standards, compliance, and so on. So Nat, do you wanna say hi? Hi everyone, thanks for being with us today. Okay, so um, do you see the table of contents? We're still good with the PowerPoint? Okay, good. So uh, before we go over the table of contents, uh, two key points that I'd like to mention. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, or if you decide you can just wait for the Q&A period at the end. Also, the presentation will be recorded um, and you will receive a link to the presentation and can watch it on YouTube after the webinar, whenever you'd like to. So the presentation will flow like this. Uh, we will review the context of the world we live in today and the impact it has on organizations. We're also going to share employee data patterns and the latest best practices for driving engagement levels. Um, and then we'll discuss the next steps you can take to track the level of employee engagement and alignment in your organization. So just to let you know, um, if you have any questions, like we said, drop them in the chat and um, Natalie or someone from um, our team, other colleagues will just flag them to me because I'm not, uh, I don't have access to the chat at the moment. So um, let's take a minute to reflect on um, all that the world has experienced um, in the last two years. So like you can see on, on this slide, uh, we named just a few, a lot of turbulence, as you can see. So there's a pandemic, uh, racial violence, war, and with that comes the vaccination topic, uh, inflation, um, the whole isolation that we've been going through, um, changing in our family obligations, salary pressure, and so on. So we named a few examples. Uh, that's a lot of change. Um, a lot of disruption. So when the pandemic started, most of us were in crisis management mode. We tried to adapt quickly. We had to operate differently from one day to the next. Organizations have had to confront issues they've never expected and find new ways to help their employees cope with repeated shocking experiences, in this case of the past two years, including illness and death, or the fear of uh, being Ill, uh, Ill or dying. So ch change is never easy and especially not at the at this pace, uh, pace or frequency. So as a result, um, you can only understand that there's a lot of emotions um, and anxiety and depression levels are, are running high. So with that in mind, we also understand that the pressure is felt by everyone. We're collectively tired because we're in it together. It's happening to all of us at the same time, which means we're all trying to figure things out together. You know, no one really has all the answers at this moment. So now that we've looked at what the world looks like today, how did that, how did this, or how does that impact people and organizations? So we notice a massive movement um, in the workforce and a massive movement a bit everywhere and new lifestyle behaviors. So just to start with the, so we named them on the, on the slide as you can see, but starting with the great resignation and health and wellness awareness uh, topics. So we've been noticing that people are leaving their workplaces for different reasons. 
uh, mainly because of non-compatible cultures or even toxic ones. There is also a lot of them are leaving because uh, there's a lack of sense of development, growth or accomplishment where they are. Um, and that has a direct impact on their mental health and, and well-being. So it's nothing new. These feelings and thoughts uh, for many or for, for some or for many were present before the pandemic. But what we went through made room for self-reflection and uh, with time more clarity on what we want and what we don't want and gave some of them the push they needed to, to take action. So Natalie will talk more about this movement in just a few minutes. But if we look at the rest of, of the, the, the topics that are on the slide, um, we notice that work models and workflows are also evolving. So in the business world, typically nothing is static. So everything is always moving. You always have to adapt to trends and realities. So that's, that's fine. But the last two years have kind of created this urgency of, of doing, doing it faster and doing it in a way where we kind of were not ready and did not have all the answers, right? So businesses have no choice but to learn and adapt their practices to the new world, to the new needs, and to a new definition of life today. Uh, these models need to be adapted to ensure sustainability. So you can no longer operate the same um, as pre-pandemic times. Uh, you're now working and leading a different type of workforce. And what we do today may not be useful tomorrow. So here we wanted to highlight the, the uh, topics that come up the, the most that, um, during um, check-ins and surveys. So just to let you know, we support many clients in their HR initiatives. And most of our projects include an assessment of employee engagement and satisfaction. So we do it through different means. Uh, so uh, surveys, for example, well, survey is, is um, our biggest example, actually. We often start with a survey. Or we can do stay interviews or check-ins, any type of conversation that we can have with employees to, to gather feedback. The questions that we um, ask are tailored to ongoing events and changes that are happening in their organization. And we make sure to ask the right questions to understand what makes them happy, what will make them happier, um, which at the end gives us great insight on the company culture and allows us to guide clients in their next steps. Okay, so this is just to let you know um, that these are the top results that nowadays we've been, um, we've been seeing. And the common thread here is mainly they want space and flexibility to allow room for a healthier lifestyle. Um, they're asking for clarity on the company's vision, values, and mission so that they can stay aligned with the overall goal and purpose um, or not. They can decide either, you know, if, it, if, if the purpose and the goal fits with what they're looking for or not, so, but they need clarity around it. More structure around their career development, starting at least with conversations about their performance and progression. So often what we see in survey results are um, employees um, you know, saying that they have no idea how they're doing. So they barely have conversations with their managers around how they're doing and how they're progressing and if they're progressing. So, um, uh, and, and you know, we've already lost a big chunk of our informal conversations when we had to go remote or hybrid or just you know, separate from each other. Um, so the, we lost these informal conversations, uh, the frequency of them and the access to the intangible. Because at work, when we were, let's say, all of us together at the office, we would have informal conversations that would give us information about how the person is doing personally, uh, if they're facing any challenges or obstacles at work. But we lost that at one point. We're kind of trying to learn how to do it again. Um, so the need to have at least structure and systems around performance management will help us, uh, will help bring us back to having these conversations. And if you have structures, uh, structure, let's say around mentoring programs, offering internal or external co coaching or ensuring check-ins and having someone, normally someone from HR overseeing these practices, you'll keep the conversation going and you'll learn a lot from your employees. 
And of course, they would like their compensation and benefits to be competitive and most importantly, fair, which is totally fair. These results are not much different from what we've been seeing for years, um, except that today, seeing that we can fully operate in a hybrid or remote environment, uh, which in many cases has a positive impact on balancing our lives, will that increase the desire to have access to that? We know that we can operate this way and we've seen the positive impact. So clearly uh, for organizations, let's say that are not offering any type of flexibility, um, well, team members are, are asking for it and now need it. So um, I'll let Natalie continue for now. Uh, she, she will dive deeper into some of the patterns that we just uh, saw. Selena. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the great resignation and introspection. Um, so the great resignation, I think that as employers, there's been a big frustration. Uh, there's a war on talent. There's a shortage of qualified, uh, you know, workers on the market. Um, I think from the employer feedback that we get, it's a lot of, you know, um, items around compensation and having to pay more to get talent and longer recruitment processes, difficult recruitment processes. But uh, rather than it just being the great resignation, we're looking at what is the why. And as Alita mentioned earlier, um, it's about introspection. So uh, prior to the pandemic, we were always go, go, go. You know, we had, you know, heavy social lives, heavy work lives, in the office, commutes, um, there was a lack of time to really sit back, reflect, think, what do I want? What works for me? How can I make things better? Now, as the world went on pause for two years, um, as work did remain, a lot of people took a step back. And, you know, with that isolation came a lot of introspection and thoughts and, you know, also say more exposure to loved ones, less exposure to loved ones, loss, traumatic experiences, um, a whole bunch of very strong factors uh, hitting on the psyche and having this time to sit back and reflect and think about it. Um, so at a time maybe prior pandemic or, you know, even uh, a little bit earlier than that, just having a stable employment was considered of high value. And now when people are taking a step back and thinking, you know, that's that's not all they want. There's more. They, people want more. And the proof of that is that in 2021, the second half of 2021, 25 million people quit their jobs. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons around that. There's, uh, you know, mental health as well, which we'll talk, talk about. Um, but what are the key things that people are asking themselves during these moments of introspection? Um, why should I work for this company? Are they connected to this company? What, you know, what, what is the why? Do they really like or identify with the culture of the company? Can they stand behind it? Behind it? Are they proud to work here? Would they refer someone? Would they talk about their organization in a positive light? Are they treated fairly? Do they feel, you know, compensated fairly? Do they feel like they have the right, you know, uh, support from their team and their managers? Do they have the advancement opportunities that are interesting for them, the ones that they want? And is their work as meaningful as they would like it to be? So these are, are some of the main points uh, that people are asking themselves. Uh, to give you a little bit of, um, I guess, practical um, feedback that we're hearing, let's say we recruit for a lot of clients and a lot of candidates, you know, um, based on changes that have happened, you know, you sit back and you reflect and say, you know what, now work from home options are more available. There's hybrid options. Um, you know, I have a family. Uh, I'd like to, you know, purchase a home. I've had a lot of candidates tell me, yeah, right now I'm in Montreal, but I'm, you know, building my house out in Mirabel. So I need to be able to work hybrid two days a week. Um, or I'm, I've, I bought a home further away from the city. So, you know, I'm looking for something that is, you know, within 15 minutes drive if I have to go into the office. So people are making those decisions based on reflections that have happened over the past years. Um, it's not all about work from home. We're also having people, you know, that are very specific in what they want. What can the employer offer me? I have decided to, you know, a specialist that has decided to take their career uh, really more specialized and um, take on more education. And then there's the sheer amount of people that maybe have made a career change, which is causing um, 
a reduction of you know qualified workers on the market. And so when reaching out to people, there are, there's less demand, there's less candidates. So trying to get somebody to move into a new role is requiring a greater incentive. These are just some examples, um, but you know there, there's two sides. There's the frustration on the employer side, and then there's you know um, from the worker perspective of what now truly works best for me. And if we flip over to the next slide, uh, we have a quote that I took out of an article, which we felt really matched um, the, the introspection behind the great resignation. So the quote, I'll read it for you, is many people reevaluated their priorities and are now making changes of their own choosing, where to work from and for whom, where to live, where to return, whether to return to the office or continue working remotely, how to accommodate the needs of children and or elderly parents. All of these other questions are being examined and now we're finding new answers. Workers are aspiring proactively to make the life that they want. So there's, there, there's a shift happening. And this is what research is showing that the, the shift is happening for these reasons. And uh, conclusively with our own personal experiences in recruitment, these are the kind of answers and feedbacks that we're getting. So mental health and wellness. So this is another big one uh, that Alita mentioned earlier that's coming back in our, uh, in our surveys. Over here, this slide is really a little bit about statistics. Uh, mental health was really big even before the pandemic, and it really blew up in the pandemic. So these are some uh, statistics saying that in uh, 2021, 68% of millennials and 81% of Gen Zers left role for mental health reasons uh, compared to 2019, which was 50 and 75. Um, so overall respondents, so that's all the generations, was 50% that left for uh, mental health reasons. 67% uh, reported one symptom of mental health. Um, and 91% of respondents believe the company's culture should support mental health. Um, another statistic, the children of mental uh, of employees are also suffering. So the visits to emergency have gone up by 24% for young children and 31% for tweens and teens. So this is all uh, interrelated. These are, uh, this is a stat from 2020. Um, so when talking about mental health, what does that mean on an organizational level? Um, people need more and more for the organization to support them. Uh, they're looking for psychological safety. So what is psychological safety? So it's when people feel safe to mention something that is hard or difficult without feeling like there's going to be repercussions or criticism. Um, so rather than just focusing on efficiency, organizations need to adapt to focus on the mental and well-being of their employees and by having you know healthy and well-supported employees efficiency will follow so what can an organization do to promote well to mental health uh, there's a whole bunch of things that they can do so one first step is just making it an, an awareness having a culture where uh, you know, people feel free to share, checking in on people, opening those conversations, asking how are you feeling, um, providing that safety. Uh, a really important part is the opposite of the psychological safety is when somebody feels betrayed by their organization and the betrayal can happen from a negative response to a situation. So these are, um, these are examples that show how important training is for managers and for um, you know, organizations as a whole to understand how to respond and how to be supportive. Most of the time, uh, the goal is not to be unsupportive or to, you know, um, give a perception of, um, give a perception that the organization is not, is not supportive, but it ends up happening through behaviors and actions that from people that are not properly trained on how to deal with the situation. Uh, some skills to name a few to support mental health is acknowledgement. So one, just acknowledging, you know, how the person is feeling and supporting. So making sure that you're there to help the person get what they need 
and building a culture of trust. So transparency, the openness, um, making those communication channels open so that if there is an issue or a problem uh, that a team member will feel comfortable to raise it or talk about it or look for a solution uh, with their organization or their manager. Um, thinking about all of the points that Alita mentioned earlier and the things that are happening throughout the pandemic, there are different changes that are making people feel more pressures of mental health. I can give a personal example. In 2020, I had my first child. I came back to the office during the pandemic. And it's not easy when you have a small child going to daycare, you know, there's viruses, there's illnesses. With the isolation, you can't give your, you know, your child to the grandparents who are at risk, there's this. So there, there's a whole, you know, pressure, there's fear, there's anxieties. And just the way that my personal organization responded to my needs as a parent, I really, like really supportive, always open to help. The response was always, hey, how can I help? Hope everything's okay. You know, um, never had any feeling of, you know, taking too much, you know, time or whatnot. Uh, always felt well supported. And I think that that really built a bond. So I've personally experienced it. And I, I personally understand how so many factors, especially during a, a pandemic, can make people connect um, and organizations should be using this time where uh, team members are fragile to build connection uh, rather than to, you know, uh, it, the flip side of that, lose connection. Uh, this is just a, a chart that we put in here. So this is a piece of a survey that uh, is part of a larger survey. That's why the percentages are not exact. Uh, but the reason why I put this in here is to show uh, the trends of mental health and how many people actually perceived that it had declined post-pandemic. So we have 85% here that said it was declined. And um, then they break it down into sub-themes. Uh, so the, the general mental health decline, increased stress, general anxiety, increased COVID-19 specific anxiety, and then increased burnout. Uh, so those are all, you know, factors related to the pandemic and, you know, coming out of the pandemic and readapting to their situations. Uh, and the reason for this chart is really just to show how, uh, how severe or how real this issue is and how, how extensive, extensive it is when you have 85% of the respondents that said, yes, my mental health has declined post-pandemic. Uh, comp and benefits. So this is a big one, interesting one for, for a lot of employee, employers. Uh, we took some results here from a 2021 survey. So 92% of organizations reporting recruitment and retention challenges. And uh, 90% of them are experiencing bidding wars in recruitment. 70% of these organizations adjusted entry-level salaries for qualified staff. And 56% of these organizations experienced a geographic market for recruitment expanded their geographic market for recruitment. And this all ties in also to the point we were talking about earlier about the great resignation and the introspection. There's a lack of talent on the market. People are making changes, causing uh, the, the talent pool to diminish and then therefore driving the prices up, which can be extremely frustrating for organizations. Uh, as our experience as consultants, we have had you know, uh, candidates back out of signed offers, which is something that has, you know, very, very rarely or not even at all happened in the past. Uh, we have had candidates, you know, talk about a certain salary and then come back with a much higher salary later on in the process, um, all kinds of things. Uh, also to take into consideration from the earlier factors, you know, inflation is going up. We put in here the consumer price index. So the past 12 month change is a 6.7, which is huge. And as people need to spend more and more money to buy things and to house themselves um, and to take care of their families, they need to have the salaries that support that. So, uh, you know, everything is just interconnected and interrelated. And uh, unfortunately uh, for the organizations, there, there's an adaptation here. Uh, now, how can they balance that? How can they make it reasonable? Um, 
you know, uh, it's not easy for, for mid-sized organizations either, but there are other options that they can, uh, uh, can offer, uh, like increased flexibility. And if we move over, we'll talk about benefits. And sometimes benefits can really uh, outweigh for salary for organizations that can't afford to boost up salaries the way that their competitors can. Uh, they can, you know, give incentives through, through benefit options. So here we'll talk about benefits. So we took the 2021 list because the 2022 is not available yet. Uh, top five benefits was child care and family benefits, home office expenses, mental health support, remote and flexible schedules, and employee resource groups. Uh, so a lot focus on the mental health area, area and the flexibility. Uh, we also put in there pet friendly benefits. So uh, many, many, many people have adopted pets during the pandemic. Uh, it's interesting for small organizations because obviously there are not many office buildings that are gonna allow you know, uh, people to start bringing dogs to work and it's, it's complicated, especially in larger organizations. But if you're a small uh, organization that has their own office, maybe you know, 10 people or so, and people can bring their furry friend with them you know, once per week or whatnot or on a schedule, uh, that can be something that's really interesting, especially for people who have made recent adoptions and have pets that have never, you know, uh, actually been alone after having been, you know, at home with their, uh, um, well, with their human while they were working for the past two years. Um, and we've actually seen this. I actually uh, was in an interview with someone recently, a highly specialized position. They were interested in the role because it was a, a smaller consulting firm. and. At the end of the interview, when I asked about, you know, the ideal work environment, he he mentioned, I have a very close relationship with my dog. I, I know that most employers wouldn't allow it, but if, you know, the employer did let me bring my dog to work once or, or you know, twice a week, that would just be, that would be amazing for him. And I was surprised because the it was the first time that anyone ever mentioned that to me in an interview. So, um it goes to show that people are asking the question, thinking about it, you know, again, thinking about what are their values, what's most important. If somebody, if an employer wants somebody to be present five days a week, then what does that take away from them? They've adopted an animal, they have new responsibilities. So it's definitely something to consider for offices that can, because um, it can attract, uh, it can attract talent that it's a, it's a rare benefit that we don't see often. So what are your next steps? So we talked about um, employee introspection and the great resignation. And now it's time to talk about the organizational in introspection. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is what kind of organization do you want to be? What are your current vision, mission, and values? Are they still uh, aligned? Are you aligned with the culture that you want uh, to present to your team and to the world, to the exterior world? Um, how does your organization look at its best? Uh, what do you want your organizations to feel about your culture? And what are you willing to do to make that change or to adapt to a new reality? Uh, so things to consider, what's the market comp comp competition? How, well, how is wellness addressed and promoted at your organization? How is the engagement and retention? And what is your organization's financial position? Where is the budget to be invested? Doesn't necessarily always need a big budget. If you're a smaller organization as well, you can get all kinds of grants for you know, doing these kind of uh, surveys and um, tests or uh, check-ins with your team to understand kind of what is the general feel. Uh, so if ever you do want to see about what kind of grants you can get to do these exercises, you can definitely reach out to Elida or myself. I would be happy to assist you. Um, but the point is that your organization is to be willing to make a change before moving in a direction of, okay, we're going to, this is who, this is who we want to be, and this is what we're willing to do to get there. And then if, if you know, guidance is required along the way, that's where there are, uh, you know, consultants such as ourselves that can, can help you with that. And Alita will talk about that a little bit later. Thanks, Natalie. So very good point that Natalie just uh, mentioned. Um, as an organization, if you're 
thinking of bringing a few changes or improvements to to your uh, operations, um, the first step is to really, you know, re self reflect and make sure that if you were to em embark on that type of exercise that at the end of that exercise, you will be um, willing and committed to bring uh, uh, changes. Okay, and not just collect information and feedback and not do. And it doesn't mean that you have to do everything that comes up in, in, in a survey or from, but at least, you know, choosing your top three and then committing to them. Commitment is a, you know, it's a two way street for sure. But at least the first step would be as an organization to, to to self-reflect like uh, Natalie was saying. So we added this slide. Um, it's our four-phase project called Seamless Workplace. We just wanted to, uh, we've presented that um, this project in, in the past, but we wanted to put it here as a reminder and also to propose a structure around your next steps to change and adaptation. So you can use this model and uh, you can use it whether your project is, uh, you know, pr preparing a return to work, um, um, whether it be full time in office, hybrid, what, whichever model that you you choose to you choose to put in place, it could be creating a new, uh, like I said, a new workplace model uh, or a new process or uh, reviewing a workflow. Really, any type of change that you like to implement in your in your organization, you can use these four phases. It's a service that we offer and that you can also carry on, uh, you know, with your with your team. So phase one is where you uh, assess your team's uh, comfort, concerns, and anticipation levels um, to a specific. Well, they ha there has to be some sort of topic or. Um, a uh, topic or a subject, and then you're assessing their comfort towards it, their concerns and anticipa anticipation levels. Um, and like I said, it could be it could apply to any change you're currently facing. So phase one is where you draft and you launch your uh, pulse assessment. Phase two is where you compile the data, you analyze it, you you, you take note of the trends. And that's where you create your roadmap based on what seems to be best suited for them in comparison to what you're able uh, to offer as an organization. So like I said, it's not everything that we can implement, but we can take bits and pieces for sure. Um, at this stage, you really want to choose and surround yourself with key people who will play different roles in making things happen. So ideally, what we see in organizations uh, when we're working with them, let's say on the project, they have us as uh, their HR representatives, if you want, so we can look at the HR angle of the project. And then you can have someone from IT, you can have someone from marketing, you can choose someone from top management, you know, different stakeholders so that you um, make sure that you're tackling um, different angles within the project. Phase three is, um, well, it's called design. So with your key people, you start building the new model based on the two previous steps. Um, and that is where, while you're building it, you're also assessing uh, the type um, of training and support, and let's say coaching that people will need to um, buy in and to be a, a equipped to, to you know, um, navigate the new, the new um, model. Phase four is where you launch your new model, and then um, you have to ensure continuous monitoring um, and feedback collection to adapt and readjust as needed, because um, it's not like a one size fits all. It's not going to be perfect. It's never perfect. It needs readjustments, but the readjustments are based on what you gather and observe from it being, um, you know, happening on site and so uh, throughout these four phases, you, like I said, you want to ensure continuous communication also. So uh, communication is very important during these four phases, um, communication on the steps, on the results, and on what the, you know, what to, to anticipate uh, next. Um, pulse analysis as well. Um, you don't have to launch a survey every time to, to analyze, you know, their, how they're adapting, but you can 
choose different channels and different ways, um, focus groups, let's say, or uh, personal check-ins or um, just to see uh, and collect feedback on how, on, on how uh, things are going. And like I said earlier, adjustments where necessary. Um, the four elements of employee engagement. So this, this ties in with phase one of the previous slide. That's a, th these are elements that you we suggest you take into consideration when you are drafting, um, when you're drafting your surveys or your focus group activities or any conversation around engagement. Um, so we've concluded that the need to cultivate a healthy level of engagement is needed today more than ever. That we've, you know, we've established that. And now when you're drafting, your, your questions or your conversations, you want to assess if they feel committed to your organization, if they're able to identify with your organization, and if they feel satisfied and energized at work. Um, studies have shown actually that managers are often not aware of what is most important for driving employee engagement. And there's often a mismatch or a disconnect between what leaders think employees need versus what they really need. So this is just, um, I guess I'm just, I wanted to, to stress the, um, the importance of asking them the question and not just assuming that, you know, what, they, what they're looking for. Um, the questions you ask under these four elements is really up to you. You can choose and tailor to specific areas that you'd like their input on. Um, uh, employee input is the most valuable data in the exercise and gives you the best insight into the drivers of engagement. They'll give you the answers. Um, so that's where we encourage you to start. And key points um, that I wanted to mention that you should add on your two don't list. So don't do these two following points. Um, so we highly recommend never to collect data through, let's say, a survey or activity or an exercise um, and just not offer updates or communication in, um, in return or some sort of commitment in return. So the last thing you want to do is launch that type of um, exercise or questions and not, and then, you know, they don't hear back from you because they just gave you or they, you know, it takes a lot for them to share um, and to share what they want or to share their concerns and to actually fill in these, these surveys and to give their answers. So if they don't hear back from you, that's a big um, no, no. And also try not to overuse surveys, at least not on the same topics. You know, if you're launching surveys here and there, two, three questions for a specific uh, project, that's fine, but not on the same topic because then um, the, the, the surveys will lose their value and, and sometimes they'll just stop, stop answering. So you really want to be very strategic about uh, what survey you want to launch and the timing of it. So this slide was really just um, to guide you um, in, in when you're drafting your, your next conversation. So yes, we highly encourage you to start connecting the dots today. Uh, and if you need any type of guidance, you can reach out to us um, for, you know, either to help you put in place the four phases, to guide you through the four phases, or to at least help you, you know, plan them. Um, that's it for, for the presentation. We, we left room, um, well, there's 15 minutes left for questions or discussions. And just a quick reminder, I said it at the beginning, the, um, that you will receive a, um, a link to the, to the recording of the presentation. A question from Marjorie. Uh, what is the time frame to evaluate my employees' current well-being? Um, Marjorie, if you can elaborate, do you mean how long it takes from the survey to getting the results?
So it depends on the size of the organization, the size of the surveys that you put to together, the, you know, the questions that you ask. And uh, normally we want to give uh, employees enough time to reflect and respond to the questions, but not too much time that they forget about, you know, responding to it. So uh, I, I would say about a week is what we normally do um, to respond. And then there's an analysis process and a communication. So depending on how fast the organization can move, it could be done in as little as three weeks uh, for a smaller organization or as, you know, as long as, you know, six, eight weeks, depending on the size and how quickly the organization moves. Uh, we have some more questions coming in. Uh, the reality of this was very well done. You were real and transparent. Oh, thank you, Jamie. <laughs> um, if you need me. Do you think that the recruitment market will adjust? Will it turn around in a few years or will it constantly be evolving? Um, That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's always evolving. It's always changing. I don't know, not what you think, but I think that um, often what we see is um, uh, accelerated changes, like big, big changes, and then slowly it goes back to some stable, um, a stable status, if you want, and then it, it will happen again. Um, that's what I think. I think eventually it will stabilize, but then doesn't mean that it wouldn't move again. What do you think, Nat? Um, so my opinion on that one is that there, we're in an adjustment period right now, and not all employers are offering the same thing. And we don't know 100% what is the norm anymore on the market. And eventually that will stabilize. And I think that the whole hybrid work from home or whatnot will, you know, stabilize. And it will either become sectors that offer it and sectors that don't. And at that point, uh, we can see some, some um, back to normal. I don't know if we're going to go back to the times when we used to receive, you know, 200 CVs for, for a job posting. And um, mm -hmm. I don't think that we have that much talent on the market willing to change positions at this time. Um, but I think that it will get better as we, as we adapt to the new um, realities. Another question, does the great resignation offer a better pool of candidates for some organizations? Are there companies seeing this as an upside? Well, some companies that are extremely flexible. Uh, so what we've seen, we have a lot of new clients that are 100% remote companies, which maybe in the past, people would be more apprehensive to work 100% remote. Uh, but we're seeing uh, organizations that are benefiting from global workforces and, uh, you know, a complete no, no office costs, very little, you know, overhead costs. And they're functional at 100% remote. So we are seeing some, some clients like that. We also have organizations that are constantly monitoring uh, their team members. Okay, what would you like? How can we make this better? Making their work environment uh, very appealing to be in the office and also offering hybrid or work from home options. So I think that that is something that uh, is very attractive especially in comparison to organizations that don't, aren't ready to be flexible. So the first movers adapting to the flexibility and the well-being um, are the ones that are seeing the benefit, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know if you have that. I think yeah. just from a um, relationship um, point of view, we have the, so the great resignation um, the people that are leaving and moving are the people that I find are the ones that really have reflected and really know what they want. So they're coming to interviews with, this is what I'm looking for, whether it be hybrid um, for a work model, hybrid, remote, even values and culture, 
um, just really an overall, just like a relationship. This is what I am looking for. And the ones that are benefiting, the companies that are benefiting, benefiting are the ones that are, um, the answer is that's exactly what we offer. And yes, okay, there's a fit. We both know what we want and we see um, a relationship, um, a fruitful relationship. Whereas I think in the past, we were just naturally more passive or did not necessarily focus on specific items during um, our search or during the interview process. So I think that's a pattern that I've been seeing in conversations as well. There's another question here, a very good question. Uh, and I feel like we've been asked this many times. What do you recommend to attract non-glamorous, unskilled and on-site positions like filing and reception? Um, so these are positions that are getting more and more difficult. Uh, there is the question of compensation and benefits, which is, you know, uh, I think the first response that employers are doing are, are hiring and uh, um, offering higher salaries for, uh, you know, lower level positions, which is kind of a double ended sword as well, because it has to value the work also that's being done. Uh, what we would recommend or what I would see as something that would be most beneficial is like Alita mentioned, providing the culture. So having that great work environment where there's psychological safety, where the relationships are good, where, you know, flexibility is offered in the sense, maybe you need on site, but, you know, if somebody needs to do a four day work week or needs to, you know, uh, have an adjusted schedule, then that flexibility is there and the openness, the conversations, um, and the relationships uh, with the manager to build that kind of uh, wellness environment. You can also try to make your on-site more fun and more appealing. Um, examples of that, I mean, you know, on-site snacks, um, activities, teams that are close-knit, um, you know, offering little things, throughout the day, places to connect, lunches, depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, like we mentioned, asking the team themselves, what, what do mm -hmm. they want? Well, how can you make this more fun? How can you make this more appealing? And then just going by the team that you actually have in place. Yeah, absolutely. And if there's room for um, improvement of processes, let's say, uh, in filing and, and at reception, welcoming ideas from, from these people on how to improve uh, systems or processes. There was a question um, that, was, that was sent right before this one too. Do you have tips on how to start changing culture for the younger generation when it has been, when it has been in the company from previous generations and previous employees who have been there for 20 plus years. So I'm assuming the question is if we have tips on how to start changing culture for the younger generation that is working with um, people that have been there for 20 plus years. So different generations in one workplace. Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Too. Oh my God, that's such a big question, but uh, there's a lot of, of uh, the first thing that comes to mind for tips on how to start changing the culture for the younger generation, I think is um, education and, and, and coaching um, on, on the, up, well, the upper management, the ones that have more seniority and that could be sometimes stuck in, stuck in doing things um, their way or in a certain way for the past um, 20 plus years, for example. So um, I, I think, and what we recommend is to, we kind of have a feel already of what the younger generation is looking for. I think that's, the, that's what we discussed throughout the entire presentation, but it would be nice to have conversations with the ones that are um, older or that have been there for many, many years. Um, just to create awareness of uh, what the, the newer generation is looking for, what type of personalities they're dealing with, the char 
the characters' personalities and and how to adapt their um, approach and behavior to to them. Um, I don't know, Nat, if you have anything to add. I think uh, one thing that I would add is the is the concept of conversation facilitation. So often between generations, there's different ways of working. And um, sometimes you're noticing that issues arise because, you know, they just, there's a different way of communicating when one expects the other to understand and it's perceived in a different way. And it's not so, um, I think that that's something that's that's really important and creating those open spaces for people to connect and figure out how can they work best together. Um, nobody is going to have the same style. So it's an adaptation process. And of course, with, you know, people that have been working in a certain way for many years and the new people coming in and wanting something different, there needs to be an adaptation and a cohesion working together. And so sometimes it's just, a coaching and a training of, okay, how do we, like, what's important for you? What's important for you? Where is that middle ground? How does that blend? How do we adapt that together? What is, what does the mix look like? And um, those type of workshops tend to be really helpful in, in multi-generation situations. Great point. Do you have any tips for supporting employees who you feel are going through a professional existential crisis? crisis? Uh, mm, I feel like my answer here would be, yeah, well, there's coaching for sure. And just like any type of relationship, just bring it back to the root, which is we're human beings, we're working together and we're the, we, we have to develop and maintain relationships. So just think of a friend that's going through an existential crisis. Um, what would you do in that case? And I think we, what you would do is start a conversation and ask, hey, what, I feel like something's up. I feel like you're, you may be going through something. Do you want to talk about it? Um, So that would be the informal way, the personal way, especially if you have a relationship with them already. But then any other, um, uh, you know, more formal practices would be through mentoring and coaching like Marjorie um, mentioned. Another uh, point on that uh, for the coaching aspect, uh, coaching is a really, there, there's all different ways to coach. So there's management coaching, there's group coaching, and then on one-on-one coaching is where, you know, we can see a lot of, I guess, for this type, like a crisis of, of working through that on a, on a personal level, which works very good, but it, it requires a self-awareness. Um, and self-awareness is something, um, it's, you know, that, this is not always easy to, to pinpoint what you want to work on, but once you do, uh, coaching can open so many doors uh, for you. So another thing that you can do, I mean, I mean that it's a little bit less personal, but offering kind of EI trainings and promoting that open culture, getting people thinking so that they are equipped to identify issues within themselves and 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 use the resources available to them appropriately. Um, So I think it's a combination, like on a higher level, the the awareness, the trainings offered, um, and then on on a personal level, yes, one-on-one coaching and mentoring and whatnot, like Alita had mentioned. And especially Nan, I think we always um, talk about, when it comes to coaching or any type of um, support that you're offering um, team members, what you want is to, yes, it's there, it's offered to them, but in return, what you also want is commitment from them, right? So if you're offering the help and the support, um, they need to be, like Nat said, first of all, there's self-awareness, but there's also like their part of, um, that they need to to put in as well. which, you know, includes uh, sharing and then working on themselves. If there's homework to in between sessions to make sure that they're, they're completed, the willingness ha- to help themselves uh, needs to be there. 
employee assistance program when personal issues. Yes, that too. Very good point, of course. You're referring them to an EAP. Okay, so it's 11. I think that is the end. Um, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we also added our uh, contact information. Um, so we're always available for one-off questions or if you'd like to brainstorm about your next uh, HR initiatives, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you for attending today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.